And that is that you've been given an invitation to come and to follow Christ. We're going to read out of Luke chapter 9 where Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me. And then he gives the description of what it takes to count the cost to follow him. So if you would, would you join me in Luke chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 18. We're going to talk about true discipleship. You may call what you are living Christianity. You may call it, in a sense, uh, being a Baptist. But is it true discipleship? Are you really living out what it means to know and to follow Jesus? You hear your phone ringing at home? Or maybe you get something in the mail that is obviously in an envelope that invitations come in? Or maybe somebody knocks at your door? It's obvious that somebody is trying to get your attention. Somebody is trying to engage you in conversation, give you an opportunity to respond to something. And you have to make a decision how you are going to respond, how you're going to treat that. And we come to a passage today that Jesus Christ reaches out to you and says, I'm giving you an invitation to follow me. Will you come and follow him? Will you count the cost and understand what it really means to follow Jesus? This is a very simple invitation, but it's also a very earnest one, a very urgent one, and a very personal one. We find here that Jesus is inviting us to participate in what it really means to be radically different from the world. What it means to be, to be saved in a, in a sense of being a genuine Christian, a genuine follower of Christ, different from the world, unique, and living out the abundant life. We know that the new life, eternal life, heaven, the abundant life, they're only available to those who respond to this invitation. The world cannot give you those things, but God waits to shower things like that upon your life. I'd like to read, starting in verse 18, and go down through verse uh, 26 in Luke chapter 9. And it came about that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the multitude say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist. And others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected, rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and raised up on the third day. And as he was saying this, to them all, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. We just ask that you would, you would be our teacher in the coming moments. We ask that you would touch us with your truth, that you'd begin to break down the barriers that we've, that we've constructed in our life, that keep us from following you and giving you 100% of our life. I pray that you'd teach us what it means to make you Lord. I pray that you'd help us to understand as we examine our own lives where we are lacking and what changes need to come about. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to know that you possess the power to make us different, that we would allow you to enter into our life in such an impacting way that we would be forever changed. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, this morning I want to share with you four statements. If you are going to follow after Christ as a disciple, I want to share with you four things that you need to to be aware of, four truths. Number one, you must make the right confession. We must make the right confession in our lives. It says here that he came about, that he asked the disciples. I think it's interesting, just to make a footnote here, that he was praying alone, and the disciples were with him. I think that makes a, a grand statement about the spiritual condition of the disciples at this time. But I want to I point you to what he asked them. He asked them, who do people say that I am? 
And they came back with various responses. They said, John the Baptist, some, you know, John has just been killed. They think maybe John the Baptist has come back. One of the prophets of old has, has risen from the dead. Elijah has come back. You know, what are the crowds saying? And if you look around today, you find out that the crowds have an opinion about who Christ is, about who Jesus is. The crowds are still out there. They were there then, and they are here now. They know something significant has happened. These crowds that were following, they may have participated in the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. They may have, have seen other miracles happen. They surely had heard about all these things. And they all had an opinion. And they expressed these opinions. The right confession, the right confession will be different from what the crowd is saying. There was a young, young pastor who went out and decided that he was going to go around and just ask people on the street corner who they thought Jesus Christ was. And they came back with, with different but very predictable answers to that. One of them said he's the greatest teacher the world has ever seen. Another one said he's the founder of Christianity. The third one said he's a good man. And a fourth one said he's one of the most famous men who ever lived. In a sense, all of those have some element of truth in them. But every one of them is lacking of the substance of what God is really trying to get across in the message of the gospel. You now, even Peter, he asked Peter, you know, who do you say that, that I am? And Peter answering for the group of them said, Thou art the Christ. Even that statement there may not possess saving faith in it. You may be willing to stand here today and to, to say, I believe Jesus is, is God's son. But the disciples, maybe they hadn't got to the next level of where true saving faith is. Because Jesus listened to what they had to say, and then he elaborated on what it really meant to be the Christ. Because I don't think they understood that. That Jesus was more than just a good man, a great teacher. But he was also God's Messiah who came to die for their sins. In verse 22, he says this, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. He begins to explain to them what Christ really means. That it's not just some conquering hero that's going to set them free. But it's one that God has sent to die for their sins. In Mark's gospel, there is a little parenthesis of, of what Peter, his response was to this. We don't find it in Luke. But Mark's gospel was written with the aid of Peter. Peter certainly remembered what he said. And Peter's response to this statement that Jesus made shows exactly where the disciples' thinking was. Peter rebuked Jesus for saying these things. And that's the point in the scripture where we find Jesus pulling him aside and saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are setting your, your mind on man's things and not on God's things. You need to recognize when making the right confession that it includes understanding our condition of sin before God. That it's not just that that Jesus Christ is something different, something magnificent, but that Jesus Christ is the answer to the problem of sin. Not just for mankind, but for myself. And you can go around and get a lot of responses from people. And if you go around and you tell them Jesus is a good man, Jesus was a great teacher, it's not going to bother them too much. But whenever you begin to say Jesus Christ paid the debt of your sin, all of a sudden they get a different reaction. The crowd is comfortable with some definitions of, of Jesus. But the right confession includes he dealt with the issue of sin in our lives. That the Son of Man must suffer and die and be raised from the dead. That is what it means to be, be the Christ and to make the right confession. The second thing I want to share with you this morning is not only that we must make the right confession, but we must make an important choice. You've got an outline in your in your bulletin, you find that a lot of this is uh, there for you to fill in the blanks. The second thing is we must make an important choice. In verse 23, it says, If any man wishes, if any man is willing to make the decision, every one of us has to make a definite decision in our life.
We have to make up our mind. We have to recognize that we cannot sit on the fence and that there is no in-between. All of us have to make a decision. Now, there was a young cowboy, and this cowboy was uh, kind of prideful, spotted a, an old hunched-over farmer one day. He rode his, his horse up, and this farmer was, was uh, standing beside his mule. And the cowboy came up and laughingly said, Have you ever danced, old-timer? And he proceeded to empty his six-gun at, uh, at the old man's feet until he didn't have a, a bullet left in them, all the time laughing. After all of his, his ammunition was gone, the old-timer just kind of reached over to his mule, picked off a shotgun, and pointed it right at the, the cowboy who didn't have a bullet left. And he says, young man, you ever kiss a mule? And uh, the cowboy looking down the barrel of that said, no, I haven't, but I've always wanted to. <laughs> You know, we have to make a choice. God is not going to put a gun barrel to our head and say, be a Christian, walk an aisle, change your life or else. He doesn't do that. But the stakes are just as high. We have to make a definite decision. And this choice is without restrictions. It says if anyone, if anyone is willing to come, the only requirement that you need to make this choice is to recognize that you need Jesus Christ, to recognize that you are a sinner, realize that you've broken God's laws, you're on the road to hell, and that you cannot save yourself. That is the only requirement. But without that requirement, this choice is impossible. Let me give you three words to help elaborate on this choice. Number one is a serious choice. The most serious choice you'll ever make in your life. It can't be taken for granted. It's not second behind what's for lunch today. It's not second behind, I wonder who the Cardinals are playing this afternoon. It is the most prevailing and important choice in your life. Realize that your very eternity depends on how you make this choice. It is a serious choice. It's also a wise choice. To not choose Jesus is to throw away so much. It's to throw away your future. It's to throw away to throw away your real happiness that is possible. It's to throw away the peace of mind that God can give you, that the world cannot give you. And it's to throw away eternity. Rejecting Jesus Christ is the most foolish decision that a man can make. Psalms 14, 1 says, A fool has said in his heart that there is no God. That is the decision of a fool. Indiana State University has a library that is sinking one inch per year. The reason it is sinking one inch per year is because the engineers who built it did not take into account the weight of the books that would be in that library. And because of that, the library continues to sink in its foundation. You know, how foolish a decision was that that they did not take that into account? How much more foolish to stand before God one day and to never have it taken into account the weight of your sin? and the impact and consequences it will bring upon you at the day of judgment. Just because you were too busy to ever get around to dealing with religious issues in your life, you never considered that, and now you stand before God with all that weight sinking you down into judgment. It's a wise choice. It's also a tough choice. We think it's simple because Jesus paid it all, but it is tough. The toughest choice you'll ever make in this life. Because it is a choice to deny yourself, to take up your cross and to follow God, to follow Jesus Christ and His plan for your life. You know, it's not big, although it's, it's difficult, it's not a big thing for me if, if I had to deny myself, you know, ice cream. Because I like ice cream. Or if I had to deny myself watching football this next year. You know, I think that would probably be the, the most difficult decision. But uh, yeah, it's possible. But to deny myself. That comes into play every second of every day. Because self is such a strong element in our life. And only the grace of God can make us victorious in that battle. And to give us the ability to deny self and its constant push to be out of the will of God and in the will of my own heart. It is a very tough choice. The mistake that many people make is that they make a shallow decision 
without ever counting the cost of what it really means to be a disciple of Christ. They do it for all different kinds of reasons that are very shallow and never really give them the, the ability to connect with that grace that's going to make them successful in it. That's why we find in Matthew chapter 7 that Jesus is confronted by those who say, but Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do these miracles in your name, cast out demons in your name? He's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreaker. You were religious, but you never knew me. You never were my disciple. Let me give you a third statement this morning. We must be willing to undergo a change. We must be willing to undergo a change. You ever wonder why firehouses have circular stairways? The reason is because they used to have horses that pulled their engines. And the horses were, were kept on the lower floor. And the horses learned how to go up straight stairways. So they had to reconstruct them and put these circular stairways in there. Well, the horses are gone. The firehouses, a lot of them haven't changed. Now, how much change has happened in your life? The circumstances in your life should be radically different if you're a Christian now and you weren't a Christian before. But have the changes come with the differences that should be there? Are you living different, thinking different, different priorities, different goals in your life? It says we have to undergo a change because you can't change yourself. Only God can come in and change us. We have to be willing participants of that change process, but only God can do it in our life. God comes along and He draws us to Himself. He convicts us. He converts us. And then God begins to work on our lives and to rearrange us and to reorganize our life to suit Him. Verse 23 says, If anyone is willing to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That means giving God total control of my life. Now that change includes, number one, a change of direction. He says, follow me. That means I no longer follow the desires of my own heart. I no longer follow the expectations of the crowd. But I learned to hear God's voice and to obey it. Matthew 10, 38 says, He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. At the end of this chapter of Luke, in verse 62, it says, Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and turns back cannot be a disciple of mine. We must learn to follow Christ, to change the direction of our life. It also demands a change of loyalty. You know what Shakespeare said? He said, To thine own self, be true. You know how we say it? At least starting in the 70s, and we're still saying it the same way. Look out for number one. We think that's brand new. Well, Adam, Adam and Eve were taught that lesson in the garden. That's the first thing the devil taught them, is you've got to take care of yourself. You can't even trust God. But becoming a disciple means a change of loyalty. Our loyalty is to Christ. Verse 24 says, For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake. You might underline that just one little phrase there. Because that is a definition of discipleship. Whoever loses his life for my sake. He is the one who will save it. Have you lost your life for the sake of Christ lately? You wake up and self says, I think I want to do this today. I think this would be fun today then you understand that God would have you to do this, so you lose those plans and you shift over to these plans. If you learned what it means to really lose your life, and in losing it, you've really saved it. A change of loyalty and a change of activity. Take up your cross. A brand new way of living each and every day. Stop doing the things of the world and start doing the things of Christ. It's also a change of values, change of outlook. The old things are no longer the most important things in your life. We begin to change what we value in life. And other things become important as God leads us down, down His path as we follow Christ. We begin to 
to value things like our soul, our Savior, our church, family, our testimony, our integrity. All these things that have a common theme to them, and that common theme is they're eternal in nature. If we examine our life right now, so much of what we invest our time in is temporal. It's passing away. It has no impact on, on heaven, eternal things at all. When God comes in and begins to rearrange our life and reorganize our life, He begins to invest us in things that are eternal. Now the fourth and final point that I want to get across to you today is that we must accept the challenge. We must accept the challenge. Jesus Christ invites us to come after Him. Can you imagine that? If I would have been 12 years old and Roger Stallback would have walked up to me and said, I want to give you an invitation today, guy. I want you to come with me and I'm going to teach you how to throw a football. The Blue Brock would have come and, and said to me when I was 7 or 8 years old, I'd like you to come and I just want to spend time with you. I'm going to teach you how to steal bases. I'm going to teach you how to play baseball. I would have, I would have fell over. I would have fainted. That somebody of that magnitude in life would have come to me and invited me to spend time with them, to fellowship with them. That they wanted to invest so much into me. And yet Jesus Christ himself gives an invitation to us and says, come and follow me. I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to provide for you, show you things, teach you things. I want you to be my disciple. And we just kind of, maybe I'll get around to it. i got some other things to do right now. You know, that is amazing to me, that we won't accept that challenge, that invitation that he gives to us. The average lifespan of a Major League Baseball is seven pitches. You look at your life, you look how the Bible describes the human life. It calls it a shadow. It calls it a vapor. You know, shadows are here for a moment, and then the sun has moved, and it's shifted and shifted. It's always changing. It's always here, and it's gone. Vapor dissipates. You look at your life in comparison to eternity, and it's just almost nothing. And yet we hold on to it so tightly, refuse to give God any portion of it, when God is offering us eternity in exchange. If we're going to accept the challenge, we must live a committed life. A committed life. Learn what it means to be set apart, to be holy, to be different. Learn what it means to identify with Jesus Christ, to learn to give up our goals and priorities, and to allow Him to just lead us and direct us in this life. To be totally committed to Him. You ever wonder what the phrase, the whole nine yards, means? It comes from World War II. The World War II fighter pilots had ammunition belts for their machine guns that were 27 feet long, which is nine yards. And if they went out on a mission and spent their entire ammunition on a target, then they came back and they gave the whole nine yards. Now that's what we need to be doing in our relationship with God, giving it all, leaving nothing back for the world, but expending it all upon the will of God. Learning to live a committed life. Jesus says here, What profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself or his soul? You know, what profit is it if, if you became the next Getty or Rockefeller or Donald Trump or Gates? If you gained it all, if you had all their wealth together, how does that compare to eternity? You only have it for just a moment a moment in time, a fraction of eternity. Now, how does that compare to gaining that for that fraction and losing everything for eternity? Not only a committed life, but also a consistent life. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and take up your cross daily. It is something we are constantly doing. It's not on again and off again. It's not in church, then out of church. It's not giving one week, withholding the next. It's not praying one week, neglecting the next. It's not studying sometimes and not studying. A disciple is constant because the teacher, the master, is always guiding, 
always teaching. Now, another dumb statistic I came across this week is that the, the longest recorded flight of a chicken, you ever wonder that sometimes? The longest recorded, recorded flight of a chicken is 13 seconds. I wonder what the, the shortest flight of a carnal Christian or something like that is when I think of that. It was chicken to really live for God. and It doesn't take much for Satan to knock us off the track. We make a commitment, but we're really not committed, consistent. And Satan throws us the first pitch and we're out. To live a consistent life, accepting the challenge. And finally, a courageous life. Verse 26 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Living a life not caring what the world thinks, only caring what God thinks. A courageous life that we will not be ashamed and that Christ will not be ashamed of us. Teenagers have to struggle so much with caring too much about what others think about them, what others are saying about them. And some Christians are, are still at that level in their spiritual life. God wants to bring us to a level of not caring what the world thinks as long as we are pleasing God and serving God. And God will take care of our reputation if we just trust it to Him. God's plan is way too big for me to try to figure it all out. All i got to do is figure out what God's telling me to do. Next step, next step. I'll let God take care of the rest. I'm not smart enough to figure it all out. I'm going to let God take care of that. And that is a courageous step because it puts all my trust in God's hands. Now Jesus calls on us to dare to be a disciple. To be willing to put a deaf ear to the world and to be willing to turn back to God and to trust Him. To trust Him for the things that the world can't give us. But God is just waiting to hand us freely from His hand. And yet we have, have held so tightly on the things of the world when God wants so freely to give us such wonderful things. Let me close by sharing with you this morning about a story I read. It's a story of a little girl. She was standing by her mother at a checkout stand. And she looked over and she saw in, in the, uh, near the checkout stand a little pink box. And this pink box had in it some imitation pearls. And they just caught her eye. And she was so excited. She said, Mommy, Mommy, can I have those pearls? Can I have those pearls? Her mom picked up the box, turned it over, and looked at the price tag, and it said $2 on it. She said, well, it would probably be all right for you to get it, but it's gonna, you got to do some extra chores to earn this money. So the little girl went home, and she checked her piggy bank, broke it, and emptied it all out, and there was 17 cents in there. Then she went to the neighbors and asked if she could to do a chore, pick out the dandelions out of the yard, and the neighbor let her do that. She worked for about an hour, and the neighbor gave her 15 cents, or 50 cents for doing that. Then she did some other chores after dinner. Her mom gave her 35 more cents. And the next day, a dollar arrived in the mail from Grandma for her birthday. So she had the money. She ran down to the store. She bought those pearls. And she was so excited, she just constantly wore them. The only time she took them off was whenever she took a bath or she went swimming because her mom said it would turn her neck green if she, she wore those doing that. But she slept in them. She wore them no matter what outfit she had on. She had those pearls on after a while, her, her father came in one night, and she had her pearls on. She was going to sleep. And her father said this. He said, Honey, do you love me? She said, Of course I love you, Dad. Then give me your pearls. She said, No, not my pearls, Dad. Dad, you can have that uh, the horse princess over there with the pink tail. Take that off the shelf. You can have that. And he said, That's fine, honey. And he left. He came back about a week later, and he said the same thing. Honey, do you, do you love me? And she said, yes, Daddy. Yes, I love you. He said, give me your pearls, honey. And she said, Daddy, take my doll, the, the one I just got for my last birthday. You can have that. And a few days later, the father came in, and the daughter was sitting Indian style on the, on the bed. He looked at her, and there were some tears in her eyes. And he said, honey, what's the matter? She said, Daddy, I do love you. She lifted up her, her little hand, and in it was the pearls. 
She says, here, Daddy, you can have the pearls. Her father reached out and took the pearls. And then with a tear in his own eye, he reached in his pocket and pulled out a blue velvet case, opened it up, and inside were genuine pearls. And he gave those to her. He'd been waiting for her to get rid of this dime store stuff so he could give her something real. And when you look at your life, you look at all the things that you are so invested in, so absorbed by them, and God is just waiting to give you something of genuine, eternal value. And discipleship is allowing the teacher, the master, to come in and to show us what really matters. And to direct us to put our life and our energy and everything in those areas. So that when we stand in eternity, we won't stand there thinking, I was the biggest fool that ever lived. I've wasted a lifetime. But we must stand there and say, say I allowed God to begin to build treasures in my life, to show me what really mattered, and to give me a lifetime. No matter what the world was saying, no matter what the world's opinions were, I lived a lifetime with things that really mattered. Would you bow with me?